Welcome to another weekly market insight. We are pre-recording this on Friday. I am out for Wednesday. I'm up in uh, Minnesota with my son doing Heartland Hockey Camp. Um, and uh, I know that Chris introduced us, but we wanted to go over kind of what we are actually going to talk about in this call because it's going to be a technical call. So just to, to kind of highlight, oh, it's already there. The highlight the uh, the items is price to earnings ratio. And what is price to earnings ratio? And how do you figure out what is a fair price to earnings? Then we're going to talk about trailing and forward PE, as well as low PEs versus high PEs. Look at some historical data. Talk about the earnings yield, the 10-year versus the S&P 500. And we're going to end it with our fundamental price target and compare it back to that technical price target that we've talked about on the work, weekly market insight several times. Why don't you start us off with where, where the technicals are pointing us? Where the technicals are pointing us right now for a price objective on the S&P 500, it's 4560. When we look at the risk rewards, we definitely see more upside potential than downside because there's a lot of support there. A lot of money, which is another technical aspect in investment accounts right now. So if we did have a, a dip in the market, it would likely be a buy the dip for most of the retail investment accounts as they try to get money in there. So I would say technically we are favorable on the market. And you often call those technicals reading tea leaves because maybe there's something underneath that they're actually showing. Uh, yeah, so uh, technicals are basically a measure of supply and demand. Now the academics don't like technicals whatsoever, but the idea is that the market is efficiently pricing everything I think the supply and demand is important, especially whenever the supply are people that are willing to sell their stock and the demand are people that are willing to buy the stock. And a lot of times that is informed by fundamental views. So if there are more people wanting to get in a stock uh, at a price uh, than there are selling, well, the price has to move up. So it's telling you that the supply for that stock is actually limited relative to the demand at the price and it moves the stock up and it can go the other way. So yes, it's reading at tea leaves, but it's a way to really reduce the amount of information that you're trying to deal with to right. say, well, when we have all the aggregate information, basically the price of the stock is capturing all that information. And I, I have found that the technical indicators are a quick way to read those tea leaves so that you can gather pretty much what the market is anticipating. Right, and people use P.E., price to earnings ratios, kind of the same way, kind of uh, this top line, well, there's something under the hood that's actually happening, but it's real. It's pretty simple to just look at the market and say, well, here's what the price to earnings are. And a price to earnings ratio really allows you to compare the price of different stocks without having to say, well, what does it mean at 100 at Apple and we have right. 50 on AT&T? Well, what you're doing is you're taking the price of the stock and you are dividing it by the earnings so that you know how much, how many dollars you're paying for each dollar earning on the stock. But what's happening in reality? When you see, the, the research shows, you know, stocks are worth the present value of the cash you can take out of it over the lifetime of a stock. Right. So just simply looking at price to earnings probably isn't enough. We need to look at what's actually happening at those cash flows because over the long term, that's what's going to drive stock performance. So you're basically saying, similar to the technicals, that one variable is actually capturing all of that right. information. So at some point, you hope that the company pays you a dividend. Uh, and that dividend is going to be discounted by some type of rate. And you're going to add up all your future right. dividends to come to your current price versus earnings. So you have your earnings per share times your payout ratio or how right. much that you would assume in dividends. Now, maybe it's not paying a dividend yet, but at some point in the mm -hmm. future it will and you're discounting that. Right. Uh, so now once you have that idea of what that cash flow from the stock is going to be, now you have to figure out how to apply a way to discount for the future right. value of those uh, earnings because they're, they're later, many years later sometimes. So how do we do that? So. When we're looking at an index, the S&P 500, those, that cash flow, when people do a deep valuation on, on it, they're going to use both dividends and cash buybacks. Mm -hmm. So you have to project what those are going to be. That gives you your payout ratio. And you're going to divide it by some equity risk premium, the rates you referenced, which includes a part of the risk-free rate, the 10-year yield that we'll talk about later. 
and a growth rate. Right. So that's getting pretty in the weeds. It is. We're going to probably do a, a top-down analysis talking about this. So we'll move next into trailing versus forward PEs because there's many different types of PEs. So you could have a PE that uses earnings backward-looking last quarter or last four quarters or forward earnings projections. So what do you like to use better? Well, I don't want to invest in the rear view mirror. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what the company did earn. Right. I, want to, I want to buy what it's going to earn. Because remember, markets are forward looking. So we want to be looking out at what we expect earnings to be in the future, not what they have been. Right. So sometimes people use trailing PEs. A lot of times it's for cyclicality, if you're trying to normalize earnings over a cyclical period. But when we're looking at the whole index, we, we want to be using a forward looking PE. Absolutely. Next, you have PEs that could be low or high. Do, do you have a preference? I don't have a preference. Um, and the, the reason is, is because it's relative to what? Uh, it, relative to historical averages, well, I don't think that's a good idea. What I want to understand is, what is a fair price to earnings that I'm paying? And if we go back up to this calculation here, and I'm not telling you guys to, to zoom in and try to understand it, basically what you're saying is, the interest rate that you're competing against on bonds is a factor here, and it's down here in the denominator. If the interest rate decreases, the price to earnings is going to increase. Why? Because, because capital is being competed by bonds and stocks. So if you can buy bonds, low interest rates, and you say, well, that means there's a price for each coupon dollar that I'm earning, that price of the bond has moved up. So then prices of stocks have to move up. So I'm really not concerned about low versus high as I am relative to what? Exactly. Now let's take a look at a historical PEs. Now when we look here at this chart, you have historical PEs in the, round, the range of about 16 and a half or so. And currently we're at 21 and a half. So if you are afraid of high PEs, which we hear all the time, PEs are too high, I'm not investing. If you said you did not want to invest when it was above the average, you really only had two chances to invest the last five years. During 2018, when the Fed was tightening, so you had to have the stomach to invest during a Fed tightening schedule. And, of course, during COVID, when price earnings had, had fallen completely, you know, the world was ending. So if you were able to buy during then, you had a chance. But if not, you, you missed out on 22% in 17. Well, and I would say, in, in whenever you're doing it uh, to, for COVID-19, it all depends on what you assume the forward earnings would be. One of right. the reasons the market was selling off is because the earnings are actually expected to, to tank. If you remember going through that, uh, it was, it was going to be a recession that was basically a depression because the entire world was, sh was shutting down. So many people's projections of the earnings were, were much lower. And then if you mm -hmm. looked at trailing PE, maybe, uh, maybe you were doing okay right. at, at first, but certainly not a couple of quarters in. Right. And so the, point I, the, the main point I wanted to show is just if you were using that as your metric, you would have missed out on significant returns in 17, 30% in 2019, and again, you know, 18% last year and again this year. So clearly, this is not a good strategy to just say, high PEs, we have to sell. No, at one, I would say that the, the high PE could be a really good signal that the market is assuming there's going to be substantial growth in earnings. And the reason that you're paying a higher uh, PE is analysts are, are, are not as uh, bullish as maybe the market is. And all of a sudden it looks expensive, but then you get into those later quarters and you have surprise after surprise as earnings substantially beat what expectations were. I also want to point out that the, the one time that you mentioned that 2018 was when the Fed was tightening. And I want to go back to that relationship on bonds versus stocks as competing for capital. Because what was happening and as there was tightening is interest rates begin to move up. So then P-E ratios begin to decrease. Now, one of the risks, if you're waiting for that, is what you had said, the Fed's <laughs> tightening. Yeah. Oftentimes, market dislocations, uh, especially significant ones, are coming because the Federal Reserve is allowing interest rates to move up. So if that was your strategy, you could be buying the market whenever actually earnings are about ready to, uh, to, to really fall off uh, the, the income statement where they're not there. So then the next we're going to hit earnings yield. 
uh, compared to the 10-year versus the S&P 500. So this is that relationship that we've mentioned several times here. Here is from 1996, so we were looking at the average uh, P.E. ratio on stocks before, and then we're going into the average or the, the interest rate on the 10-year U.S. Treasury, where from 1996 to present, the interest rate has been in a downward trend. Now, it does have movements through this, uh, but we keep talking about price to earnings for stocks, and there's an easy way to figure out what the price is for earnings whenever you have this interest rate, and that is simply to just flip the chart so that we could see the price per bonds have been increasing since 1996. Now, there are certainly time periods where you do see interest rates beginning to increase, meaning the price of bonds decrease, and we can see that relationship here. If we go to 1996 through 1999, what's happening? Well, PEs are expanding, interest rates are really dropping. The price that we're paying for earnings and what those future earnings will be. So there's two ways that it can go. The price to earnings can change on the multiple that you're paying or the future projections of the earnings uh, will change. Great, let's get into a projection. Absolutely. So if we're trying to come up with a price target for the end of the year, we need to look at well, where are earnings gonna be at the end of this year and to use a forward multiple, we need to see well, where will earnings be at the end of next year. So we use a consensus estimate. End of the year is about $191 on the S&P 500 in earnings. And looking out to the end of 2022, we're seeing about a 12% growth rate to get $214 in earnings. And that's a consensus. Can you explain consensus or how that is derived? Well, there's a handful of analysts that follow this and we're just taking an average of, of what they're saying. And of, of course, there's always can be air with consensus, and it happens more with individual stocks, but when it comes to the total market, these guys are pretty good. Right, and if you think about it, that's, that's all the analysts that are out there re reviewing the market, it's just the consensus of what their average opinion is, which is obviously gonna be related to the market, these are the very people that are putting price targets on there. Uh, so can they be wrong? Absolutely, we've seen them wrong many, many times. But is there, uh, is there accuracy as a consensus better than ours? Absolutely. You're taking advantage of probably thousands of brains mm -hmm. that are uh, punching these numbers and seeing different things in different aspects. So we probably couldn't do a better job, certainly on the amount of time, than right. just looking at what the consensus is. And that consensus number is probably going to be more accurate than ours. And each individual uh, person, if you were to take one analyst, is probably also by themselves not very accurate. But whenever you look at that average, it's been the closest that we've found. Right. And so if we take a, a multiple that the market's currently paying and we think that that probably makes sense throughout the rest of the year, that's that 21 and a half multiple, and we apply that to next year's earnings of 214, we get a price objective uh, target by the end of the year of 4,600. And I just wanna remind the viewers on that multiple, on where that is derived. The multiple that you're paying for the earnings is really a factor of your discount rate, which is very, very sensitive to interest rates. So if interest rates are steady, you're not gonna see a change in the multiple. You may see a drop in the price of the market because earnings expectations is decreasing, but not the price. I would actually argue that during that dislocation, whenever the market is selling off, you actually have a higher PE multiple that's a fair price because interest rates are oftentimes decreasing during that dislocation, meaning that the PE multiple is actually expanding. What's happening is the future earnings are not going to be realized or are less likely or more uncertain to be realized, and that's why the market is moving down. Right. And we can run through a couple other scenarios as well, which is... Uh, you know, a, that was our base. We could have a bull as well. Let's, let's say earnings grow at 15% and the market does want to pay a higher multiple for those. Well, now we're starting to see a, a price target of around 5,000, which is 15% upside from where we are. The base was about 5 to 6% upside from where we are today. And then we should probably spend some time on what could happen in a bear market. And, and right here we're saying, well, earnings are coming down to 8% and they're going to pay a lower multiple as well downside of 10%, but it, it could be much higher than that. 
Uh, th there's always a bull and bear case. Whatever the price is, is where the two have, have come to agreement on, uh, based on probability. Uh, but absolutely. So what what's something that could cause that bear scenario? I would say uh, it's something that we've mentioned uh, in the last couple of weekly market insights, maybe even a daily three by three, is maybe the market is pricing in a second lockdown uh, where the the economy shut down again so that earnings would decrease because corporations uh, at least uh, a lot of the service related uh, uh, industry would as well as airlines and other things that opposite of the reopening trade a closing right. trade uh, would begin to have their earnings removed because we don't expect them to have that and we've even heard uh, secretary yellen today friday mentioned that that is a possibility and we've been talking about this being a possible explanation for why the market is moving the way that it is. Now, the good news, if we do get that scenario, is we're already in the positions that would do well, at least on a relative basis, if that scenario was to play out. Because it's the growth and the tech names and the large cap companies that would be the beneficiary relative to other equities uh, that would be able to uh, to move up in price based on that. So if that bear case scenario, the, that one specifically, was to materialize, well, there's no change in the uh, our, our portfolio. It's the technicals that have led us to there as that probability increases. Now I would still say that the probability of that happening is still low, mm -hmm. uh, but the market is going to price it in because right. it's possible. Where I'm seeing some of that being priced in some of the, the gaming casino stocks that I follow where the fundamentals look really good. Casinos are relatively full. Business looks good. But they're afraid of what, what could possibly come if you do see that Absolutely. lockdown. And since we don't know this for certain, it's always based on a probability. And, that's, and you're going to say, well, there's a 30% chance that our earnings will right. not be that high. It'll be this high. So then you start uh, weighting that as a discount factor of, well, let's expect that. Exactly. And where we sit, we can compare what, what we've done to some other analysts out there. There are a couple bear cases out there from Morgan Stanley and Bank of America that are saying 20% downside as almost their base. And of course, the exact opposite is true. There's several up on the upside that say, no, there's 30% upside from here as well. Right. We, we had a, a call with Professor Siegel. He's probably one of the bigger bulls out there. Uh, and part of it is because he, he thinks that the, the economy is, is really moving and there's going to be inflation that many of the companies can pass out uh, to the consumer. Uh, so if that's the case, earnings would be moving up. Uh, and let's say that we're assuming 6% growth, you get to that 15 to 20% and all of a sudden the market's going to go up by the same amount. So we started this off with our technical call of 45.60 recognize that this is reading tea leaves, but also understanding that it's really a measure of supply and demand. And lo and behold, whenever we look at our fundamental value, whenever we start weighting these different, uh, uh, the bear case, the bull case, the expectation of, uh, of earnings, we come to a fundamental price of 4,600. So we're pretty much right on there. And we think that makes sense because one, we're using consensus uh, numbers, so it's kind of the average of what the market expects. And then those individuals are buying the different stocks and bonds, the different indexes, and you, you end up getting a, a technical indicator that says, well, this market is expecting at the rate that it's growing and as how long as it took us to get there of a price of 4560. So we really like those technical because it, it simplifies the information gathering in a process and they, they tend to be right on the money relative to the fundamental view. We're going to uh, throw our slide up here at the end so that you can kind of see everything that we just talked about in expectation. We don't expect you to understand it. We're just kind of showing our work. I have a seven-year-old. Every time he does his math, he can do it in his head. But I say, no, you need to show your work. So I'm in honor of Ira. We're going to show our work as well on how we came to that $4,600 value. I hope you enjoyed this. Please like us, like the, uh, the video uh, down below. And um, if you're not already subscribed, please subscribe. And if you have any questions and you want to discuss this with us, uh, we, we're happy to have a conversation on this fundamental view, price to earnings. We know it's a technical call. We apologize that we have to use so many numbers, but I hope we brought a little bit of clarity here on the, the price to earnings and what GW, GWS's thoughts are on the current market and why we think that relative to other asset classes, 
We still favor equities. That's where you want to be. It's certainly better than the 1.5% that you're getting on treasuries while the CPI is coming in at 5.4%. Thank you. We appreciate you listening.